Okay, so my name is Terry McGlade. I'm with Flynn Canada in Toronto. Hi, I'm Jenny Hill. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. And today we're going to have a look at some of your case studies. We've got six lined up to have a look at. We're going to talk a little bit about their past, their history, and how they've got to where they are quite recently when I surveyed them over the last two summers. And I think also we have to talk about the the concept of success and succession on Green Roofs, which is what this topic is about. And also I think it's the first time that we've actually taken a good serious look at green roofs over a long period of time and I like to sometimes think that we are entering into a green roofs 2.0 so what do we mean by success and succession? Well we've looked at the succession of management of these different case studies we've looked at the classical ecological succession so what's changing in terms of the vegetation but we need to explain that I mean what is classical definition of succession. We're not actually looking at forests developing on these roofs, are we? But as <laughs> in somebody, most cases. But as somebody said once, you know, the perfect green roof is a tree is a tree uh, nursery. And that I always thought was very amusing because one does see trees growing on green roofs. Well we can touch upon which of the roofs that we perhaps saw some woody species growing on as we go through these case studies. I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about the history behind them as we go. But continuing on about the definitions of, of what we were looking at, what was important in that when we looked at success and succession, there was definitely a change from the original design intent to what the green roofs become. That's quite an interesting point, particularly in the city of Toronto, where there's quite a strong emphasis on the design intent. And the oldest of these roofs that we're looking at now is going to be over 10 years. I think it's 12 years old, the oldest roof. And so naturally, we're going to have seen some sort of development of that ecosystem as it's been growing. And also, it really, it really helps to keep in mind that you know, we're dealing with a living system. And I think that the green roofs were always thought of, oh, okay, once they get outside the warranty period, then they're, they're going to take care of themselves. And believe it or not, that's true. Green roofs do take care of themselves. And especially when we looked at the management of these green roofs, which is part and parcel of what we should really be looking at when we put a green roof in. Who's going to take care of it? How is it going to be taken care of? Is it going to have watering? Is it going to have no ma any kind of maintenance? And there are costs that we have to assume are part of green roofs as they mature. Before we move on, I think the last thing I'd like to say by way of introduction is that uh, a lot of my research focuses on engineered substrates or soilless substrates and I was really interested to look at these projects because these are all, um, they're mostly, I think five out of six of these projects are a very high compost blend, which I find is dominant or, or it's certainly um, one school of thought that's happening a lot in southern Ontario, but I'm not hearing a lot about it happening in other parts of the world, not this very rich compost and so it's interesting to see how these have developed over this decade time frame uh, I was looking at compaction in terms of the depth of the roof to see if any had been lost due to degradation or erosion and so we can talk a bit about that as we go through these case studies too and I, I think also that we should in a way be aware that six uh, five out of six are um, and, and did not start as sedum only roofs and that's been another part of I think our discussion about green roofs that right now there is a high propensity towards sedum only roofs and this is this is leading to a, a almost um, dominant culture that a green roof is only a sedum roof so we we've seen some different roofs here Without further ado, let's move on to talk a little bit about what the local legislative framework for Green Roofs is. Now, the City of Toronto, when it passed the Green Roof Bylaw, it had some uh, amendments attached to it. One of them was the, that the plant selection and design shall be such that within three years of the planting date, the selected plants shall cover no less than 80% of the vegetative roof. 
So three years in, uh, a lot of these roofs are going to be a bit, quite a bit older than that, but we're interested in, or I'm hoping to hear from you anyway, a bit about the plant communities and whether or not the selected plants are what we're seeing in these older roofs. So let's move on and have a look at our first case study. This is at the Earth Rangers. So this is an environmental organisation, and so they were one of the pioneering organisations in our area to install a green roof because they've got this uh, mandate, this focus on environmental education. And so this was built way back in 2003. And it had a um, less than three inches or 75 millimeters of soilless medium, which was a um, Suprema Superfloor X, which is uh, highly um, mineral content. Uh, in fact, uh, in most um, Suprema Superfloor X roofs, the mineral, um, which is a lava rock, will flow to the surface. and the other components of the soilless medium stay below. But remember, this is only a three inch roof or 75 millimeters with no watering and no maintenance. And as we go on and look at these pictures, what we see here in 2005 is that the growth of the Sedum communities had expanded to almost their full growth size by 2005, which would be two and a half years after planting. And then we move into 2010, and the issue there was that there was no nutrients left in the soil. There was, um, the, because it had been a couple of very hot summers, the growth had, had slowed down, and the sediments were holding their own, but they were certainly weren't being uh, extremely uh, vital. They had, their vitality was kind of really like, I'm here, but that's it. There's a lot of substrate exposed at this time, but that's not how I remember seeing it by the time I got around to seeing it. So we were asked in 2010 to come back in and help revitalize this roof. So we added organic, um, we added, actually added lime and we added um, a lot of uh, um, mushroom compost and worm compost to it. So we basically try to revitalize it, revitalize it through organics. My understanding is that this roof also receives intermittent irrigation when it's very particularly dry. And maintenance. And also it receives regular weeding and so actually the original vegetation on this roof is still quite evident. There's quite a strong design you can still see very recently. And also I think that we, when we started off with like about 12 different sediment species, we've ended up with about four or five, which is typical, I think, of most sediment colonies. If you look at mats, if you look at trays, they start out with eight and end up with about four. So it's, it, this is a typical sediment pattern. Okay, and we'll touch upon another roof at the same site later on in the project, uh, later on in our presentation. But let's move on to a different one. Uh, this is built on a very different type of substrate. This is uh, built on a very compost dense substrate, built in 2005 at a university. So again, there's that educational connection. Can and you tell us a bit about that? And also the um, the building behind or the building that overlooks the uh, the green roof is 12. 15 stories high and the green roof is at 8 and the, the mandate from the uh, housing uh, community beside this green roof was that they didn't want to look at bare earth, they wanted to look at something flowering. So it was decided uh, that, that they would get daylilies, um, as one kind of daylily that would flower for about two and a half months. And now the big thing about daylilies is that they they grow as colonies. They they set out and then they they replicate themselves into a, a, a about a two foot uh, circle. Of course, that is based on certain conditions. Well, we see them used in landscaping at grade a lot in this area, and I'm very familiar with seeing these daylilies all grown together in clumps. By the time I saw this roof, uh, something quite different had occurred. So by 2010, I was called back and asked um, what to do because the monoculture had been invaded by 56 species. Um, and the daylilies were still there and they asked what they should do. And I said, well, you'd have to dig everything up and separate the weeds and everything and then replant the daylilies. And they said, well, how much would that cost? And I said, well, you know, 
got a couple of, you know, got fifty thousand dollars, you you could do it. And they just shook their heads and said, "We're a university. We don't believe in." maintenance on that level. Well there's no access to this roof um, by community groups at this time because there's no parapet and so it had really been left to its own devices. This is one of the roofs where we did see one or two woody species that actually blown in and started growing. The grasses in this photograph are actually about waist high and what we can't see here is that the, the daylilies still which are uh, more low than the grasses, but below that there is a continuous understory of deep hair cap moths that developed on this roof. So in fact we've, we've seen here a perfect example of succession starting to happen. Um, and I think that with the no maintenance and no watering, this is a fantastic green roof. Oh, it was one of my favourites. It, it was a joy it, to visit. It was alive with so many different varieties and so many different um, activities going on from a, a plant and a spe uh, insect species and also birds were coming in. They were. It, you know, I have a surprise for you though. Yeah. Let me show you what happened when we went back just last year. Yeah. So it's now been taken over by a community group of students so it's sort of changed from its original scientific intent to a sort of nature, ecological, urban area into actually now a very productive vegetable garden. Um, there was a lot of people working on this. And I think uh, we both cried because it was, the, before this, it was one of the best examples of what happens or can happen in this ongoing succession world of green roofs. And we have to really understand that, that if you let a green roof go, it doesn't die. Well, what we're seeing here is su succession in management. So there's different priorities and people want different things from their roofs. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens to this in coming years and how that project develops further. I know that urban agriculture is a hot subject these days. Let's have a look at the, another case study. Yeah. So this one's also at an educational institution. Well, Jackman Public School um, Committee was composed of parents and teachers and kids who wanted to see a dead roof that was about 2,000 square feet that, um, that was on the second floor of the school but was visible through the classrooms. And they wanted to see this dead roof become a green roof because the rest of the, uh, the school yard had become a very successful uh, urban garden and planting. So they wanted a green roof that also reflected that as well as have a lot of native plantings. And so the substrate is very organic um, and uh, it's about six inches and we planted almost 12 different uh, species of plants. Let's see it's at the time at which you planted it. So this is, a, this is a year later after we planted and how the growth is happening. Now the interesting thing is that um, certain species were d were planted with the idea that they would become thugs. This is a roof that is designed to transform itself. Did you predict which species would turn out to be the thugs though? Uh, everything I thought was going to grow in, and take care or colonize its own space did that, but others just took over. and. We end up with a wonderful green roof like this. And at one point at City Hall, this roof was used as an example of a no maintenance roof. And the parent volunteers were asked, how much time did they actually spend doing maintenance? And they said once a year with a few bags of green garbage bags they were taking off the roof. They were conducting that maintenance on the day when I made this visit and this photograph and I think we did pull out a, a few woody species and a few saplings and that was pretty much the only maintenance that was taking place. What we can see in the foreground of this photograph is the dominance of penstemons in the shaded area next and, to the building. And you know, penstemons are one of the plants that nobody thinks of using on the green roof. Why not? Well, maybe because they actually are a, they're a self seal cedar and they move around and they will colonize whatever open space that happens. Um, the grasses did survive and they have gone through some really horrible winters and a lot of grasses don't like, don't like um, the cold on the green roof. Uh, but these grasses, which are native grasses, are doing exceptionally well. I think if you look at the at the beginning of July 
um, you see the small plugged in plants and then you move into August of 2006 and you see that huge growth that happens as the plants mature and then the transformation from 06 to 14 it's eight years yeah that's got a big to expect gap in our knowledge it's a shame that it, you've got to expect that the the plants have moved along they've colonized differently there's no really big studies on, on how plants colonize on a roof yet okay what, what I tested when we were out there in 2014 was a lot of the substrate characteristics and it didn't have such a lot of moss as some of the other compost based roofs that we'd looked at. It's a less wet roof overall. Uh, it hadn't had any sort of uh, loss of depth, so there was no evidence of any sort of compaction or erosion happening on that substrate. Although we can see in the first 12 months there obviously was some exposed substrate just did in that you, first summer. Did you find a higher organic content than original? Um, it was probably, uh, off the top of my head, I think it's around 50% loss on ignition, so that would be absolute organic matter, and that is typical of something which is almost exclusively compost, so that's indicative of uh, the uh, high organic school of thought that we see in some of these designs. Okay, Terry, let's talk about the Toronto Botanical Garden. So this was constructed in 2005. It was constructed on a deep compost medium again, on a very steep slope. And there's a bit of a teaser on this slide already. We can see that this is some of the very deep hair cap moss that was evident by 2014. But let's have a look at how it went in. So uh, the original mandate um, that the architects wanted was just a green roof. Pretty simple, a green roof. So we convinced them that it was better to have at least four different kinds of green roof plants in there to kind of create a mosaic. And so we we did four different species of sedums and um, you know like chemication and um, sedum spurium and sedum album. So we we had those as our basis and and but because it was on a north facing slope. Um, the roof was always uh, has different growing patterns. Like the top quadrants actually get full sun, the lower downs don't, and this led to a different kind of growing pattern. But because it had no maintenance, it had no maintenance. It had no maintenance, despite the fact that it slopes towards their office windows. And also, besides the fact that it's a botanical garden. They spent all their botanical gardening time on the ground and had no, nothing left over for the roof, which is also tricky because it is such a steep slope. You have to harness off, you have to roll off. I think that's fair, yes. Yeah. It's difficult it's, to sit on it's that it's roof. It's very difficult. But the interesting thing was that because we actually did something that was unique in that we, we realized that as the slope hit the bottom of the, of the roof, it actually had to have some kind of drainage in it. So there is a tile drain that's going, running all along the whole bottom to take off any excess water because we were afraid that the water would just take all the earth and just move it around. But this has led to some very interesting new plant colonies. And what we've seen is we've seen, um, you know, woody, woody shrubs up there. We've seen cedars, we've seen hydrangea, St. John's wort. Um, and as you can see from that 2013, um, there are sediments still in the picture. Yes, at certain times of the year, I believe, the colours come through really strongly again. So there was four different quadrants, I believe, with different... Four different quadrants, and they're still there. But they're not the dominant species anymore. What we've got here is a roof that is truly going through succession. Maybe one day it will be in forest. It certainly retains a lot of water on that roof, despite its sloped condition. That, that compost material, combined with the mosses and, and the sedums, are really working like a great big sponge on this roof. So do you think the, um, the uh, moss is definitely a problem or a, um, a helper? Well, now, you know that I'm interested primarily in green roofs as stormwater constructions, and so the mosses actually intercept and hold water like a sponge, so I, they are a helpful thing from that perspective. And do you think most green roofs would go through a heavily uh, moss period in their lifespan? 
Well, my findings from a much wider survey of roofs have shown that actually moss is highly correlated with the age of the roof, regardless of the design parameters that were put in place originally. So yes, I believe that uh, it's one of the early stages of a process called pedogenesis or soil formation, that we would expect these sorts of early simple plants like mosses to develop. Let's move on to another okay. case study. Well, this then. We're is very interesting. No, no, but it's, it's very interesting. I mean, when, especially when you look at a roof like this, at, um, which was done in 2005. Now, the interesting thing about this roof is that it is um, a soilless blend. It is a soilless blend with a certain amount of compost in it, but it was a seeded roof. And because it was a seeded roof, the first year, was it was patchy but it was, it was a seeded grass wildflower mix. Now the wildflowers are still there, they're very intermittent, they've always been very intermittent, but the problem with this roof is that it has never been watered. I mean, it, Is that a problem? You say it's a problem? It's a problem if you want to retain green uh, look all season, especially in the heat of, of uh, August and September in, in Toronto, it can be it's so intense it, it burns out most... Um, it's like a classical prairie though, we can see that late in the season it's, it's getting brown. very dry and, and brown. brown. And the, I know that the manager of this site is actually primarily concerned with abiding by green roof bylaws, he's interested in them for their stormwater function, but he's not really a horticultural man, he's an engineer and no. he's very happy to just let the roofs be and just to progress in this fashion. And Low maintenance is a good thing for him. And this proves a point that your roof will undergo certain changes and if you allow it to do that, you're going to be happy. Look at it in May. In May it looks like a total green carpet of grasses, but by you know October it's always going to be brown. Here there was a very different moss community. What, what, what I'd seen on this roof was that the mosses had dried out during the summer. They were much uh, shorter mosses, and they were actually clumping and then breaking apart. I know that that's one of the things that people with green roofs can be concerned about when these cracks form in the moss, and then this gives space for seeds and fly-ins to actually establish. But because it's not a highly aesthetic roof, this one, it wasn't a great concern for them. Even though it's extremely visible to the student community who walk along a corridor and see it every day as they go to their classrooms, it is, is still one of the best roofs out there, and it's, it all, it's over 10 years old. Uh, and it will keep transforming itself, even under no maintenance. Now, the, the Royal Ontario Museum is a special green roof. It is really a suspended green roof over top of the roof membrane, and it, there's a two-foot gap that separates it from the roof. So really, in fact, it is a non-heated green roof. Uh, and the load capacity uh, was the biggest problem here, and that resulted in us going to a very, very special soilless mix that ended up, the weight of the soil is three pounds per square foot per inch. And that's the lowest ever. And to do that, it's all compost. Totally all compost. It's Mostly only seven and a half centimeters deep as well. And it's only seven and a half. Just, just three inches. It's, in some places, it's only two and a half. And it is ridiculous. So the design concept was a very heavily designed concept that was never able to be maintained. Um, certainly after it was installed, um, we, and we used uh, erosion control blankets because we were afraid of it. The compost is so light that any piece of, any wind, any wind would just pick it up and... I was going to say that. We can see them with that light tan colour with that um, yeah. sackcloth that was used to hold it down. And there are 14 different varieties of sediments in this roof. Whites, pinks, yellows, reds, um, and... Is also, that in terms of the flowers or in terms of the fall colour? No, that's sense? in terms of the flowers. But to, to help us in this roof, uh, to protect the sedums in a way, we planted chives and we also planted equisito horsetail grass. And we figured that they would be around so that the sedums could actually take hold and be good. Well, what in fact happened was that the sedums are there they're not doing much, but the chives in May have are absolutely fantastic. 
they're all, it's a purple carpet of chives because they've spread everywhere. And the equisetum has also spread in different places. And so we have a different plant ecology than what was designed. But again, it is not maintained. Well, this roof, I believe, is receiving irrigation. Because it's so very shallow, it would dry out so very rapidly. But July 2013, we had a remarkably wet summer. And so we see it looking particularly lush in this summer. The following year, uh, I'm seeing it, it's a similar sort of time of year, but we've got a little bit more dryness showing up. Uh, and we also went through a terrible winter, um, so every green roof in Toronto went through a true. very slow start period. So th when this was taken, the roof by June was just getting itself going. Um, it's hard to evaluate what winter does to green roofs because there isn't enough research and certainly there isn't enough study done on uh, the impact of minus 25, minus 30 on green roofs because we haven't had the chance to do that. That's another whole other topic. Um, <laughs> Should we look at our final case study then yes. before we wrap up? So that we're returning to the site of the very first roof that we saw with the sedums that were on the lava rock type substrate, but I believe that this section of roof was actually replaced with a different type of substrate. Was that in 2010? That was in 2010 also. and. Our mandate was to give them a three season flowering uh, green roof and to do that we did replace the soil and we actually got to add a, a bigger depth um, so we went from three inches to five inches uh, and that makes a huge difference especially if you're going to go into bigger perennials than sedums and so we got rid of all the sedums we transplanted them over into the, into the other two roofs on the site and we started in, um, with a, a combination of uh, geraniums, liatris, um, phalaris uh, arundi picta, which is um, gardener's garters, it's a very invasive grass, and uh, um, a panicum forgatum. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so, and also coreopsis. Yes, I remember seeing that um, too. Which, funnily enough, um, became. Uh, a problem because it died out. So this was all on a compost-based medium? On a totally compost-based medium. And as you can see, after three years, this is the incredible growth that we had. That um, And also color. It's colorful from the start of the chives in May through the geraniums in June and July, and then the, the liatris takes over and the grass fronds are around. It's mostly all in shades of uh, purple though. The coreopsis, aren't these the yellow flowers in the foreground? Are uh, they replacements? Those are replacements, uh, but there's uh, rutabecchias. They're not, they're, they're um, not coreopsis. My bad. But um, the great thing is that it shows that um, you can go back into a green roof and revitalize it and make it a different green roof. Uh, and maybe every, maybe every five, ten years we have to do that. We have to look at the plant colonies, we have to look at what's working, we have to look at the soils because we have to say, does it need more? It's a closed system. We are always going to have to look at that from a question of like, is that closed system still working? Well, so much of it comes down to client expectation. I think that was one of the things that I really took away from this look at these different roofs was uh, what people were happy with in terms of what their roof had become. But also, I think one other underlying thing is what the soils are doing. And if the soils are doing what we hope they're doing, which is keeping the plants alive, then we will have continuing green roofs. We have seen green roofs that die. A lot of reasons for them dying. But we need to keep exploring and examining and analyzing a green roof over time. Not one or two years, but really a long period of time. So what's going to be next for you then, Terry? Well, I think that I would like to go out there and fight another battle. I think that we need to start looking at green roofs 2.0 from the point of view of what really works. We know that in Western Canada, we can't do set of roofs and hope that they work. We have to go to a much more plant, native plant ecology. We, in Eastern Canada, it's the same stories. We just are overridden right now by the quote unquote sedum, uh, sedum world. And maybe that isn't the true 
um, world that we need to be looking and working with. We need to start exploring, and I think the research that you've done is helping to us to understand what the real growth of a green roof is about. So these six case studies actually form just a small snapshot of over 30 roofs which I surveyed over the last two summers and my next 12 months is going to be involved quite a lot of writing up. I've got a couple of journal articles that I'm going to be writing about this survey and about some other work that we've been doing at the Green Roof Innovations Testing Laboratory at the University of Toronto. And so sadly, after having spent so much time out on the roofs and in the sun, I'm going to be probably in my office. And we're, next, and next we're hoping that your research is going to help in, in the dialogue, the, uh, the ever-changing dialogue about what is happening on green roofs. And we look forward to, to working on many, many more green roofs. Thank you. Thank you for showing us around these case studies, Terry. Thank you.